Hello everyone, so I'm not sure where else to mention this, so I'll mention it now. My computer is getting very, very slow to the extent that almost like the entirety of everything I'm doing in my life now is centered around finding good moments to render videos because obviously rendering uses a lot of my computer power. So I pretty much have to make sure that if I'm planning on doing something, I'll like make it so things which I'm doing are either off the computer or like not involving too much work on the computer, like, you know, reading or, um, you know, reading something on the computer or writing on Microsoft Word. These are all things I can do when it's rendering. Obviously, I can't uh, even hope to be editing something or recording something when the uh, when the computer is rendering. Uh, and with that said, I think that I will give myself a, uh, a Christmas present this year of a new uh, computer. I think this computer has, has made it like five years, which I would consider to be the minimum turnover for a laptop. You want a laptop to last like five years. That's just me. Uh, but yeah, with that said, if you wanted a good reason to give on Patreon for the end of this month and of course into the coming new year, then that is one very good reason because I am going to uh, have to be incurring an expense of getting a new laptop principally for the sake of this channel. If it wasn't that I had to render so many videos, I wouldn't really have a need to... Uh, change my laptop. The reality that I'm running all these videos is why I need one. So there we go. So for this video, I want to talk about something not particularly like intellectual, or academic or theoretical. I just want to talk about the phenomenon of strange trans-identified individuals on Twitter. Mostly I should say, of course, trans-identified males. Uh, and I use the word strange because I think it is the least loaded term to use, but I think it will become apparent what I mean when I say strange. So I want to stress right away that when I say strange, I don't mean mean or abusive uh, or something like that. Uh, obviously there are people who are, um, you know, trans-identified who are mean and abusive, uh, people who send horrible, disgusting messages, principally to women, uh, messages, you know, of, of threatening sexual assault and death and physical violence. Now, having said that, I can also accept that there will probably be some gender critical people who are similarly unpleasant, uh, maybe not in the exact same way, but for example, I know that people like to talk about the old 41%, and I think that's not a good thing to do. I think uh, that making a reference to that particular thing and insinuating somebody should do it or uh, trying to make a joke out of the fact somebody might do it is pretty repulsive uh, and I'm not you know I mean obviously no don't do that um, but of course Twitter is a terrible place but that's the thing you know ultimately to an extent I can say yeah both sides are they exactly the same type of bad or do they come in the exact same degrees I'm not sure what I can say is of course that I've seen lots of uh trans-identified individuals being really horrible and abusive. I haven't seen it as much from gender-critical people, but it's possible that's just my own individual uh, bias. However, it is worth noting that for gender-critical individuals, uh, I think it's harder to distinguish a gender-critical person from a conservative person who is not critical of gender. Uh, obviously, if you're a... Con well, can you be gender-critical and conservative? I'm not totally sure. But certainly, if you're you know conservative on gender, which is to say you support traditional gender roles and stuff like that, I would say you can't really say that you're critical of gender. Uh, so that's personally my take. Uh, but with that said, of course, both conservative uh, critics of transgender identity and gender critical critics of transgender identity, both are critical of transgender identity. And I think seeing as transgender identity is a pretty substantial argument uh, that actually you might get the case that is lots of kind of right-wing 4chan types who are sending messages uh, and it wouldn't necessarily be obvious just from them disagreeing with somebody's transgender identity whether they're conservative or gender critical. So with that said, I think it's possible that when you talk about kind of the 41% thing, you can't just see somebody being critical of transgender identity, dropping a reference to 41% and assume that this is a gender critical person because there's other people aside from gender critical people who are critical of transgender identity. So just wanted to stress that. I think interestingly, the reverse isn't so much true. I don't think that trans identified individuals and transgender identity advocates are uh, automatically get grouped in with uh, just broad other misogynists quite as much. I think sometimes it happens. For example, a lot of the time when a, a transgender identity advocates like to go on all about how uh, radical feminists are horrible because they're mean to men and they have all of these horrible ideas about men, 
I think the MRA is like to get on board with that and, and run with it. But I think generally speaking, the misogyny of most misogynists is slightly different from the misogyny of gender identity extremists, such that a gender identity extremist defending transgender identity isn't as likely to lead to an overlap. So the point there is that I think any unpleasant messages from gender critical feminists could easily be coming not in fact from gender critical feminists, uh, because it could just be conservatives who are also critical of transgender identity. Conversely, it seems like all of the horrendous, disgusting, abusive misogyny coming from from transgender identity uh, advocates and gender identity extremists is entirely from them. It's not that this is just MRAs being mistaken for them, you know, MRAs who are neutral on the subject of transgender identity. No, it seems like every single person sending these abusive messages is a, a TRA, a gender identity extremist, whatever else you want to call them. That's, that is representative. Uh, so I think, you know, ultimately... On balance, I would say even if the amount of abuse from both sides is equal, you've got to bear in mind that one side is made up of two different people who don't really agree on very much. One's conservative, one's feminist, they don't really agree on very much. Um, whereas the other side is a unified group of people who are basically saying that transgender identities are valid and they are almost universally misogynistic. And you can tell that from the messages they're sending. Um, and I would argue they're a more coherent group. So that's just an, a distinction I think is worth bearing in mind. But what I really want to talk about is not the meanness and the, you know, obvious flagrant misogyny. I want to talk about the obsessiveness of these people, because that's what, in my opinion, makes it strange. You know, like people being mean on the Internet. I don't think you can say it's strange. It's quite a normal thing, unfortunately, on the Internet for people to be really unpleasant. But being like obsessive about a particular individual you dislike or a particular idea you dislike. Uh, I think that's something which I see a lot from gender identity extremists. And I want to stress, I don't have a big sample size here because I don't really like to engage with uh, transgender identity advocates, gender identity extremists very much online because it's just, it's just annoying. I mean, and to be fair, it's something I've become less keen on as a result of what I've observed um, in this video or what I'm going to explain that I've observed in this video. Uh, so while my sample size isn't huge, Based on just the small number of people I have interacted with, it seems like there is a general tendency for these people to be obsessive in a way that is, like I say, strange, that kind of makes you wonder what exactly is going on, on mentally for these people. Because the thing is, it's quite common for me to interact with these people and then for like the next 24 hours after I've like responded and like after I've basically said, okay, I'm done with the conversation, it's over, they will just at me Several, like half a dozen times over the next 24 hours. It, I, I mean, I would say in some like bid to get the last word, but no, to get apparently the last six, seven, eight, nine, ten words, um, or rather six, seven, eight, nine, ten tweets, obviously, um, you know, more, more than one word per tweet. Um, but that's the thing. They'll just like constantly, uh, message me. And here's the other crazy thing. You know, you would think like, oh, it's, it's, you know, just sure there's, you know, strange, crazy, obsessive people on, on Twitter. But the thing is, it's like, it's the high profile people, you know, like it's, it's the people with lots of followers who are doing this. Like people who, I mean, I don't want to imply that Twitter followers really speaks to, I don't know, doing well in your life, but people who you would think should, should really have like something else to do or should maybe just have, I don't know, maybe like slightly more secure egos based on the fact that they have these followers, which, you know, you would think they'd interpret as some degree of like validation. Um, but no, one person disagreeing with them is enough of a reason for them to dedicate the next like 24 hours to, I don't know, going through, like I, I've had conversations with people where they've, they've disagreed to me. I've disagreed to them. I've said, okay, you know, I don't really feel like getting into a pointless Twitter argument, um, removing myself from the situation. And then I'll get messages from them like, hey, I watched your video here and it was stupid. And hey, I, I went back through your Twitter feed and saw you had this conversation. It was stupid. Like just letting me know all of the different things they, they hate about me over the next 24 hour period while I'm just ignoring them. Uh, it's, it's weird. I'm sorry, but it's weird. It's strange. Um, it's obsessive and it happens way too much from people who are way too like, well, uh, platformed, whatever you want to say, like they've got way too many followers to be being like, these aren't some strange sort of outlier trolls or anything like that. These are major uh, Twitter users. And the thing is, like I say, it's a small sample size, but it's very interesting because uh, literally just this morning, uh, somebody, I'm not going to remember their name. They are a furry. They have the word wolf in their name. So I guess they're a wolf. 
Well done. Um, and like any good wolf, I guess they spend time getting angry about people on Twitter. Um, and basically, Brazen She Rants. I gave Brazen She Rants a shout out recently. Um, of course, not that recently. I'm recording these videos considerably in advance because I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this. I should have mentioned this. I'm away over Christmas. So, um, that's why I'm recording all these videos in advance. Right now, it's still November. Uh, I will let you know the first video I'm actually recording in December. Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, it was today of me recording this. It'll be a while ago by the time you actually see this. Uh, and I gave Brazen She Rants a shout out. And Brazen She Rants was apparently really, really happy about this, you know, really stoked. So I'm not trying to big myself up here or anything like that, but Brazen She Rants is a small channel and I saw that Brazen She Rants had made a video on a topic I was, I'd made a video on. So I was like, Hey, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to give a shout out, gave a shout out. And, uh, you know, obviously if you're a small channel, you get a shout out from a channel that's relatively large in the kind of gender critical space. You, you like it. You get excited about it. You get happy about it. And basically, uh, a friend, significant other, somebody who uh, lives with Brazen She Rants, uh, basically tweeted saying, hey, you know, I, I just heard Brazen She Rants. She was really excited because she got this shout out. And I, I'd say if you're kind of a normal person, you read that and you're like, okay, that's, that's like a happy, nice thing. You know, a small channel gets a shout out from a channel that clearly Brazen She Rants is a fan of this channel, um, gets a shout out and is excited about that. Um, you, you think that's like just, yeah, you just kind of be happy about it or at least like neutral. You know, it's quite a nice thing. Um, so I want to, <laughs> I want to read you this comment from this person. Uh, I don't have it up, but I'm going to get it up. Oh, Rachel the wolf is the name, uh, at the wolf spirit one. Uh, imagine being happy to get boosted by the guy who got publicly served by Vorsch of all people, lol. So. There it is. Imagine being happy that your small channel got a shout out from a bigger channel. And then I basically responded, I just said, imagine deciding to be negative and mean-spirited on a tweet about a small YouTuber who's happy to have got a shout out. You really are a deeply and profoundly miserable person. Hope you get better. Because that's my attitude. Like at the end of the day, there's very little about that tweet I care about. The only thing that I really feel in response to it is just sadness, like a deep uh, sense of sadness that this is what like somebody's mentality is that they see like a tweet that should just make a normal person think, oh, that's nice. You know, I'm glad this person is happy. I'm glad this person. And, you know, like the original tweet, you know, I'll read out the original tweet. Uh, at Brazen She just got a shout out by King of Farazon. Thank you, sir, for absolutely making her day. I heard her scream outside and thought something was wrong. Lol. So, yeah, thank you for absolutely making her day. Like, it just seems like a really happy tweet. You, you just, if you don't, it's kind of like one of those stand situations. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Cause it's just a happy tweet, somebody being happy about something. And you just decide to come in like, Oh, this guy got served by Vorsch. Here's the thing. Just on that subject of me getting served by Vorsch. Um, I don't really remember the debate very well. The main thing I remember is it being a really, really hot day. Like that is my enduring memory of that debate. And I remember basically just feeling so hot the whole time. And I had like a, f a frozen solid glass of water or bottle of water next to me. And I was pouring the ice water into my glass so I could just be constantly drinking it because it was just the only way to cool me down. It was just such a boiling hot day. Um, but the only other thing I really remember is Vorsch kept like basically my point was that if you want to understand gender depression, it matters what the word woman means. If you want to say that I actually recently pinned a tweet, which I think touches on this. If you want to say that I am a woman, that my, that I am a victim of patriarchy, that my oppression is the oppression of women. I think that you've now made it so every single thing you're seeking to describe no longer has any real meaning. Like if you want to say I'm a victim of patriarchy, patriarchy has no meaning. If you want to say I'm a victim of misogyny, misogyny has no meaning. If you want to say I'm a woman, woman has no meaning. Um, that was basically the, point I was trying to get Vorsch to understand. And Vorsch kept rather obtusely saying, but I do understand all of these things, which wasn't actually a response to what I was saying. And I think after a while, I, I realized that we were just going in circles. And I think I sort of just went into autopilot, um, basically just keep making the argument that Vorsch hadn't responded to. And then I remember at the end, Vorsch, I think it was very, he, he wanted to end the debate, which to be fair, I don't blame him. I wanted the debate to end too. It wasn't particularly productive. Um, so for some reason, he decided that me saying that my viewpoint makes intuitive sense was like a good thing to end on and as if like that was a, a bad thing. So I don't know. For some reason, Vorsch thinks that 
I guess that kind of sums up everything. To me, that kind of sums up the debate. Vosch thinks that um, that having in- intuition on your side is like a bad thing or something. Now, having said that, obviously, this is this is my memory of the debate as someone who hasn't watched it all the way through uh, since. Well, I sorry, I haven't watched it all the way through. Actually, I've never watched it all the way through. I've um, I remember having the debate. And since then, I've not really, yeah, at some point I would like to go back and break it down, but I just don't really care. Uh, but anyway, what I wanted to say is that, okay, let's say it is true that I lost the debate. It's, it's possible I lost the debate. Um, like I say, all I can remember from it is what I remember, but I'm sure I could have handled it better. Uh, now, with that said, why harp on it? Okay. Why, why do that? I, make so many videos on this channel. I have, by the way, challenged people to debate since then. Uh, and ultimately, but you know, ulti- I, I mean, I'm not a debate person. Like, here's the thing. I had a debate having never had a public online debate before. So it's like, if, if I lost that debate, does that really matter? Right? Like, oh, I lost the first debate I ever had online. And now I have continued to just, make loads of other points on my channel, you know, I continue doing it. It reminds me of, um, there's a YouTuber who basically criticizes Islamic apologists, um, which obviously, if you know anything about me, you know, that'd be of interest to me. Um, and the thing is way back, like years ago, he had a debate with a British Islamist called Muhammad Hijab. And, uh, the thing about the debate is that by some standards, I think you could make a sincere argument that David Wood lost the debate. Uh, mostly it wasn't that, uh, Mohammed Hijab had good arguments on his side, but that David Wood just didn't handle himself particularly well, which of course can happen to anyone in the debate. But here's the thing. Okay. Let's say David Wood lost that debate. David Wood has done dozens of debates before then, and he's done quite a significant number of debates since then. He has continued debating since then. He's debated before then. Uh, he continues to make videos on his YouTube channel, criticizing all of this stuff. And yet, to this day, you will still get people in the comment sections. Like, the overwhelming kind of message from uh, Muslims who are upset with David Wood is uh, basically, you got owned by, by Muhammad Hijab in a debate. Your career should be over, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, wh- I'm sorry, but if that's your attitude, I don't think you deserve to watch debates. Like, if you think that the point of a debate is that two people have a debate, and then if one person just underperforms in the debate and doesn't do very well, that means that it's something that they're just going to carry around with them the rest of their life? No. No, it's like you have a debate, you either win or lose, and then that's it. So the thing is, even if you think I lost the debate, why are you bringing it up to me a year and a half later? Like, it's it's been a year and a half, and this is the only thing you can bring up. And this is made particularly sad by the fact that this individual... Uh, writes for the Crit Facts YouTube channel. And I have responded to the Crit Facts YouTube channel. So, here's, here's the question. Why is it that you're bringing up Vorsch and some conversation I had with Vorsch a year and a half ago when I have responded to you more recently? You know, isn't that just like an admission of defeat? Think about it. If I like make a response to somebody, and then they respond to me, and then I come back at them like, oh, you lost this debate against this completely other person. Isn't that just an admission of defeat by me? It's just, it, it's it's really weird. And um, I, I'll say this on the record, you know, uh, if anybody from the Crit Facts channel wants to have a debate, have a live debate, I'm down for it. I, they can, you know, all of them. I know that it's a collective, collectively run channel. They can all line up and uh and have a go i'm fine with that uh you think that i got publicly served by vorsch i don't know what i do know is that my ideas are correct um and i think i if anything just over the year last year and a half got more confident in defending them and everything else if you want to renew this insistence that i'm you know what some kind of embarrassment because i lost like even just running with that idea i did lost because i lost one debate uh, it's absolutely absurd. And what does it show? It shows the obsessiveness of these people. That there's a debate I did a year and a half ago, which I don't really even care about. And yet people are going to come back to me a year and a half later, like, 
on a post that's supposed to be like some happy debate to be like, oh, you, you got, you got destroyed by Vorsch. Like, okay, do you want to like maybe have some kind of new interesting criticism? Or are you just going to like reference something that happened a year and a half ago, uh, which is kind of broadly unrelated to actually my genuine presence? You know, I'm not a debater, right? I mean, I, even challenging people to debates, I'm saying it, saying I'm not a debater. I'm just somebody who happens to be correct, which gives me a considerable advantage. Um, that's why I always say that I, you know, wouldn't even prepare for a debate because I just don't think it's worth it. Ultimately, I don't think you need to prepare for defending truth, really. Or, well, sometimes you do. But uh, if it's just like a common sense thing, like that biological males can't be women, I don't think you need to prepare for that. So, yeah, um, uh, crit facts, you know, your, your writer... Somebody who writes for you wants to come and uh, take like a happy positive tweet and decide to attack me and make it about how what I'm, you know, just I, I mean, I don't even know what the criticism is supposed to be. Just I guess because I lost one debate against somebody, nobody should ever feel enthusiastic about me or my presence online ever again. Very rational, very reasonable uh, take to have, by the way. Uh, but if you really feel that, yeah, sure, feel free to... um actually give yourself something a bit more current and a bit more related to you to actually uh, bring to the table and uh, yeah debate anytime down for it but the ultimate point here is just why are you so negative and mean-spirited and sad and obsessed uh why don't you just go be happy why don't you just go live your life i i mean i just I, I, i'm happy not only in that i don't just allow myself to obsessively just like go on to other uh you know like or other twitter users other youtubers whatever else uh onto their twitter accounts and just decide to say mean-spirited things to their fans to feel good about myself i'm very happy knowing i'm not that kind of person and i'm more happy just seeing the uh state of people who would actually do that just be like yeah that's that's the kind of person I never want to be, and I'm very happy that I'm not the kind of person who would ever be like that. And just as an aside note, this didn't happen to me, but I also saw it on Twitter, which was, it was two people who I think were both fans of Demon Mama, uh, who both thought Demon Mama is a woman, who were arguing with each other really angrily because <laughs> there was a third person in the discussion <laughs> saying that Demon Mama was a man and referring to Demon Mama with male pronouns. And both sides of the debate were getting angry at each other because they didn't seem to realize that there was a third person involved. I don't think this falls under like the category of them being... I think it does, though. It kind of does fall under the category of them being obsessed because the only explanation I can think of for how neither of them noticed is because they were so angry. <laughs> they were so angry in this debate that I was looking at. Um, there was a moment where one of them said to the other, you're a turf. And the person said, no, I'm not. I, I hate turfs. And it's just like... Um, and then I think the person said, yeah, but you're transphobic anyway, or whatever else. Like, you may, you may not be a turf, but you're still trans. And it's like, they were getting so angry. And neither of them had noticed that there was a third person in the conversation. And my only explanation for how they didn't notice is because they were just so furious, like frothing at the mouth with anger at what was happening, that that's the only explanation I can think of for why they didn't notice that they were arguing <laughs> based on, like, something which neither of them had said. And I think there's no... I, I mean, you know... It's just very funny, but I also think it really does substantiate the idea of, like, that's the kind of attitude these people seem to have. Like, I think it's the same attitude that makes these people have a furious, angry, uh, really intense argument based on something that neither of them said because they don't realize a third person is the person who said this stuff. That's the same kind of obsessive, furious anger that will make them uh, just obsessively at you for 24 hours after you last spoke to them. Still, like, being like, oh, I... Uh, you're an idiot. You're, all your fans are stupid, but whatever else. It's the same kind of obsessive anger that will make somebody bring up a debate that happened a year and a half ago as if it like is in any way meaningfully relevant to your YouTube channel where you've been making content pretty consistently for that whole last year and a half just you know, without any real regard to that debate having happened. Uh, it's that kind of obsessive idea. So let's talk about Grace Lavery. Uh, Grace Lavery has actually, in theory accepted a debate with me but i think in a um kind of i'm i'm a reserve so there we go there's a thing uh but yeah grace lavery uh tweeted at i think helen joyce and julie bindle i don't really care to remember the exact details of this because that doesn't matter but definitely helen joyce uh tweeted at helen joyce at i think two in the morning british time 
And then, within only a couple of hours began, you know, probably more than a couple of hours, I'm saying, what I really mean is like a few hours, um, started tweeting saying that uh, Helen Joyce had refused to accept the debate and then said, and I, I particularly like this, said that they were doing this to expose how hollow the claims of just wanting to debate are. You know, so showing, oh, well, I, I said this person was going to, uh, you know, I wanted them to debate me, but they didn't accept immediately. This shows how hollow their claims that they want a debate are. Now, what happened, unsurprisingly, is that pretty quickly, quicker than I would, by the way, I mean, I guess you can kind of tell I'm not particularly enthusiastic about Twitter or social media in general, um, which I think in some ways is actually to my detriment, but certainly from a mental health standpoint, I'm pretty on board of it. Um, not that I'm saying every single person who uses Twitter is, you know, uh, you know, you can you can use Twitter all the time, and maybe you're just in a different situation than me. Personally, for me, from a mental health standpoint, it's not something I'm into. And I think from what I see, it seems like for a lot of people, from their mental health or for their mental health, it's not working out very well for them. But uh, anyway, basically, Helen Joyce ends up saying, "Yes, I'm down for the debate." And then what happens is uh, Grace Lavery kind of conti- uh, starts being like. Oh, you know, it, it's like in some way trying to cast doubt on the idea that the challenge has been accepted, being like, oh, you know, said they were down for it, but that's that's not an absolute confirmation. That's not 100% signed contract or whatever. Um, continues this for a few hours, basically trying to act as if the debate still hasn't really been accepted and as if great, uh, sorry, um, Helen is kind of prevaricating on accepting the debate when that's not happening. And then this is the interesting thing. Uh, later on, people start saying that they think Grace Lavery is actually going to back out of this debate. They're saying, oh yeah, you know, it seems like Grace is going to back out. And Grace Lavery then starts documenting people speculating this and saying, look at how how silly these people are. They think I'm going to back out of this debate uh, based, based on no evidence or whatever. Like they think I'm going to back out when I'm obviously not. Now, here's the thing. I don't think it's worth saying Grace Lavery is definitely going to back out, uh, although I think it's certainly reasonable to speculate that. And here's the reason I think it's reasonable to speculate that. And I communicated this to Grace several times during this um, whole situation because I was watching it all unfold. And I did at one point tell Grace to stop tweeting about it so obsessively because it does look a bit concerning seeing somebody just tweeting so much about this. And I remember actually in the conversation that Grace actually did respond to this and basically said, yeah, but people keep saying I'm going to back out. So I'm going to show how silly they're being saying that, which had also been said after I pointed out, it's not really silly to speculate that Grace might be about to back out. But I basically said, yeah, but the thing is, it's Twitter. Like there's always going to be somebody responding to you. Always going to be somebody speculating. Always going to be somebody saying something which you might not like. Um, the trick is you, you don't let it get to you. You don't just tweet about it obsessively. Genuinely, I would like to think trying to give Grace Lavery actual productive device, uh, sorry, uh, device, advice. Um, but okay, here's the thing. Why is it pretty reasonable to think Grace Lavery might back out? Well, I think it's for two reasons. Uh, firstly, precedent, right? These people, and precedent in two cents. First of all, these people really do not want to debate. They really don't. And by the way, the fact that like a lot of people who do seem to want to debate this are people who aren't even like they're more like debate me bros than uh, actual gender identity extremists. You know, like they're debate me bros first and gender identity extremists second. So, okay, like maybe in that sense, it makes sense that they would be willing to debate. Um, although even then, I think very rarely, I know, for example, that I was supposed to debate Demon Mama, believe it or not. Um, this was a thing that was happening behind the scenes on Discord, except for the fact the person who wanted me to debate Demon Mama was kind of a neutral person who wanted to host the debate rather than it me being me going on Demon Mama's channel, because having been on Vorsh's channel and being shouted down and talked over and stuff like that, might have been nice to have a neutral moderator there. It wasn't, that's the kind of other thing, it wasn't even really, in some sense, I mean, I know I called it a debate, but in a proper sense, it was not necessarily even a debate. There wasn't a neutral moderator there or anything like that. So yeah, basically Demon Mama backed out of that debate based on the fact there was going to be a neutral moderator. So it seems like even the debate me bros, they don't really want like a proper debate. They just want to have people on their channel for content basically uh they don't want to actually you know engage in a proper kind of actually organized debate and things like that so point being it seems like these people really don't want a debate on top of that you have the fact that they even back out of debates a lot of the time 
they really like backing out of debates. And hold on a minute, do I even have, I just realized, I don't think I even have, um, yeah, I haven't even written this, which I probably should have. I mean, it was kind of implied by the person who, like, keep, kept tweeting at me. Joss, somebody? This Joss person kept tweeting at me. But the thing about this Joss person is, they ha they made, like, an open um, challenge to anybody to debate them. And I said, sure. And then basically, the, <laughs> it was kind of ridiculous. Um, what happened is, I said, okay, I debate. Then Joss said, you're a man, don't want to debate a man, which there's a like, strange thing going on there because you're assuming that like somebody being a man is relevant. So surely being a man should have like a clear meaning, in which case, you know, that would seem to, whatever. Anyway, um, so yeah, I'm a man. And then, then it was, if you can get 10 women to endorse you, then I'll debate you, except I got the 10 women to endorse me. And literally while that was happening, um, also, I think actually Joss might have like accused me of, I tweeted like, hey, endorse me. And then I think Joss actually replied like, why, why are you trying to get clout from this debate or something like that? I was like, what, what are you on about? Anyway, but then Joss basically said, oh, actually, you know, I've seen, I've seen, I know who you are now and you're an idiot. So I don't want to debate you, which the logic there makes no sense, right? Like you're an idiot. So I don't want to completely destroy you in front of everybody. Okay. Um, and then, and then it changed to, okay, now I, I just want to debate uh you know biological females which is yeah like i say there's a weird thing in that being what you want uh as somebody who doesn't really think somebody being a biological female is necessarily even that relevant um but then the thing is biological females started accepting the debate and then this joss person started saying prove you're biologically female which how do you do that without being uh, you know, things being overly invasive. I know somebody's going to say right now, they're going to say, oh, you're a hypocrite. You, you're recognizing that it's overly invasive to expect somebody to prove it. But here's the thing. Okay. I've said before, and I'll say it again. I don't think that the actual how you prove somebody is biologically female or biologically male is relevant to the question of whether or not being biologically female relates to being a woman. It could be possible, hypothetically speaking, that, you know, there is no way to absolutely prove it without being super invasive. I accept that. But, that doesn't, you know, it's a difference between ontology and epistemology. So yeah, it's not, I'm not being a hypocrite in saying that. Um, and basically the point is, apart from anything else, Joss, and this is the key thing, wanted it to be a Twitter debate, literally wanted it to be like text debate. So what I responded saying is, hey, you know, if you did agree to an, a uh, video debate, like an actual audio visual debate, then it would be probably more easy to see whether or not the person you're responding to is actually biologically female. Sure, it could be. In principle, a man may be doing a very good impression, especially in like a, a um, audio debate, you know. Uh, however, it would probably make it, you know, certainly, for example, it would not just be somebody like me uh, pretending to be a woman because I couldn't even, you know, if I was in an audio visual debate, I couldn't even pretend to be a woman. I wouldn't, you know, know where to start. Uh, so, yeah, basically, I responded saying, hey, you know, if you have an audio visual debate, you'll know whether or not the person you're talking to is a biological female or at least be able to reasonably infer that they are. And Joss said, no, I don't want a uh, audio visual debate. I only want to have a debate on Twitter, but also I need people to be able to prove to me that they are biologically female. And it's like, I, I don't know what you're on about. Um, it was, and yeah, that's the point. These people back out of debates uh, all the time. And within that context, if any gender identity extremist agrees to a debate, at this point, it's perfectly reasonable to speculate they will back out of it simply based on that precedent. Just say, oh, this person's agreed to a debate, therefore they're likely to back out of it because that's what they do. They, they try to start these debates and then they back out of them. Now, the other thing is uh, that obviously Lavery seemed to have been going into this with dishonest intentions from the beginning challenging somebody to a debate and then immediately being like, oh, they don't really want to debate me, makes it seem like you're not actually interested in the debate, you're interested in the performance. So as soon as that performance doesn't actually work and you show, oh, wait, turns out all I've shown here is that these people are very willing to debate. Oh, you know, uh, maybe maybe the point of actually the um, performance is lost. Now, again, it's possible Grace Lavery actually wants to debate, in which case, I guess, uh, it won't back out. However, if Lavery does, as seems to be the case, just want to do this to try and get some kind of optical victory, if it becomes apparent that's not actually going to work out and all you're going to end up doing is being in a debate with somebody, having to defend ideas which you don't really want to defend, you don't want to have to defend them, then maybe you'll back out. So the question becomes, why do all of this? Uh, you know, why 
challenge somebody to a debate and then obsessively just be like, oh, they haven't responded to me in a few hours. So I'm just going to immediately say that they, uh, you know, are afraid of me or something like that. Very strange reaction. Why start documenting just like random people? Like this is just like people with only a few followers saying like, oh, you know, you're going to back out. Why bother, you know, with that? Why print screen it or, you know, screenshot it and put it up on your Twitter account. Be like, oh, these people, look, they think I'm going to back out, but I'm not going to back out. Why do all of that? Why get so stressed out about it? Get so worked up about it? Um, try to act like you have this really big point when you don't. Why? Now, the, I think, ultimately entirely cynical interpretation would be that, of course, kind of what I just said, these people are trying to basically do a big kind of no you, like, hey, you don't want to debate. And the reason they're doing it is just to be like, try to make it so these people, you know, gender critical individuals seem like we don't want to debate when we do. And it's all 100% self-conscious uh, or 100% like you, they know what they're doing. I'm, I, you know, they're choosing to show all this stuff to try and make their opponents look unreasonable. And even as they're doing it, they know that they themselves are being unreasonable and misrepresenting what their opponents are actually about. But I think the reality is slightly more interesting, which is that from what I've seen from these gender identity extremists, they're generally just, you know, I don't want to use loaded terms, which is why I've used the term strange most of the time. They are strange. There's, there's something wrong. Uh, and that's the thing. Like, I genuinely think that Grace Lavery tweeted basically saying that because somebody hadn't responded within like a few hours, it meant that they were a coward who refused to actually engage in the debate. I think Grace Lavery tweeted that believing sincerely that that was a reasonable thing to conclude rather than it being like a cynical haha i'm going to make it look as if uh, helen joyce is afraid to debate me no literally i think it was tweeted just because grace Avery was like well you know obviously if somebody challenges you to a debate you know you're on twitter all the time you're constantly checking everything you know obviously you're you're the kind of person who it, it's completely reasonable of course to just uh, screenshot every single little comment you get from somebody of course you should just be looking at all of this stuff so the fact that helen joyce hasn't responded to me immediately means it's perfectly reasonable to conclude helen joyce is afraid to debate i genuinely think that a lot of these people they're not even being and i've kind of i've said this before in like different forms it's kind of a conclusion i always come to i don't think these people are grifters i don't think these people are cynical i don't think these people are manipulative i think they genuinely believe everything that they say and everything that they do and i think that is hilarious and terrifying it's it's you know and obviously i usually talk about in terms of like the actual substance of their beliefs but also just in this case not the substance of beliefs but it's what's believed to be reasonable uh you know believing it's reasonable to conclude if somebody hasn't responded to you within just a few hours that must mean they're afraid of the debate by the way, I, I recently actually, you know, somebody said uh, that they would come on my channel and destroy me. So I said, okay, come on my channel, destroy me, name the subject, name the topic, name the time and place, or not time and place, but time and date. Didn't get a response. So I ended up, uh, I think, over a week later, quote tweeting them and being like, hey, this person said they were going to destroy me. No response after a week. That's the point. It was after a week, um, not after, and you know, I only did it because I think it was in the, um, it was actually in response to uh, Grace Lavery. So basically it was in that conversation and um, it was at the time when I was also engaging someone else and I was like, oh, I remember this person was supposed to destroy me. Significantly, by the way, what I didn't do is like at this person obsessively for like a period, you know, like next 24 hours and then like after that, you're like, oh, duh. no, just said, okay, do you want to debate? Didn't get a response. A week later, I was like, I never got a response to that, did I? So went back, quote tweet, hey, Nice one. Uh, good job. You really showed that, that uh, you could destroy me and that I must actually be, uh, you know, scared to debate or something like that. Um, yeah. Ultimately, uh, and the thing is, like, the actual context of that whole thread was literally, like, people claiming that somebody said, gender critical feminists don't really want to debate. They just say they want to debate and then they never actually debate anyone. So I literally said, okay, I'll debate you anytime. And then this other person who doesn't even, you know, wasn't even part of the conversation then jumped in being like, I'll debate you. So literally it was like, two for the price of one one person be like oh you don't really want to debate and i was like oh you know don't think we want to debate i'll be happy to debate you then someone else someone different person says i'll debate you i'll destroy you and i say okay you want to debate i'm fine to do it no no response uh it's it is ridiculous and i think with all that said this is why it's kind of shocking to think that these people actually believe that they're reasonable and they're correct and that they're right that gender critical people don't really want to debate and they think that that uh you know 
somebody being challenged and then not responding after just a few hours is evidence that person secretly is a liar and doesn't really want to debate. They think all of this, and that is, like I say, it's kind of funny, but it is kind of, it's terrifying in terms of making you realize the actual sort of personalities we're up against, not just ideas, but personalities. But the thing is, it's obviously worth pointing out, they're very, they're very bad at what they're doing. Like, they're not very good at this. And I think part of it is that they desperately want to be us and not be them. Uh, they want to be the side that actually is willing to have a debate. They want to be the side that's basically out there saying, hey, you know, challenge us, you know, have an actual conversation with us, have any kind of open free debate. We want that. They want that to be them. But the problem is it's, it's not. And I think it almost, the impression I get is it's like, they'll make these challenges and then they'll be confused why it doesn't work. You know, like I think Grace Lavery wanted was like, oh, I, I know, I'll do what the gender critical, because think about it, gender critical feminists like to call out gender identity extremists for refusing to debate us. So Grace Lavery thinks, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to call them out for refusing to debate us. So challenges Helen Joyce, then after a few hours, just says, oh, look, afraid to debate me. Ha ha. Look, I I'm doing it. I I'm, I'm doing the thing the gender critical people do, where they point out how the other side is afraid to debate us. And then you have to imagine Grace became very confused, very upset, very distressed when this didn't work because, oh, turns out actually Helen's perfectly happy to debate. And I, I think that must be kind of frustrating. I remember there's a, um, a joke in Jake and Amir where, uh, Jake and Amir, the college humor thing that was around a while ago, kind of absurdist comedy, which I think, you know, absurdist comedies are a good thing to reference when talking about gender identity. Um, where basically, Amir kind of sets up this elaborate trap, uh, expect trying to like get Jake to agree to something. And then, uh, he, Jake agrees to it. And then Amir's like, that's impossible because that didn't really happen. But then it did happen. And, uh, and Jake's like, why, why did you, why did you say it didn't happen? And Amir's like, well, I wanted to, I wanted to catch you in a lie because you're always catching me in a lie. So I wanted to catch you in a lie. Why are you, what are you sorry about? I'm sorry that a wolf ate your dog. I didn't, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Whoa, 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 what'd you say? You're sorry that, that a wolf ate, that a wolf the wolf ate, ate my, your dog. I never said that a wolf ate my dog, huh? You did. It was the only thing you said to me. Actually. Did I? Yeah. Yeah. Said. Right. Right. Yeah. Dang it. You have to admit, that would have been pretty clever, though. Sure. If I caught you like yeah. that. Yeah, would have been. Yeah, so you admit it. Yes, that it would have been clever if you were right. I still feel like maybe you think I killed your dog. Yeah, I'm like 50-50 on it. Do you think I'm a wolf? All right, okay, fine. I don't have a dog, okay? I just wanted to catch you in a lie. You don't even have a dog? What are you talking about? I just, you always catch me in lines I thought I'd catch you once. Don't get sentimental and try to make me feel bad. This is the stupidest thing you've done in a long time. And you carved my initials into your hand last Oh, week. wow, oh, big don't. whoop. And I think the idea there is it's like, Amir doesn't understand that the reason Jake can catch Amir in lies all the time is because Amir is always lying. And in Amir's like, uh twisted logic head which is you know the backbone of the you know comedy of the show in amir's head he thinks that just doing the performance of what jake does will amount to him actually being able to catch jake in a lie he doesn't understand that there actually has to be the tendency to lie there in the first place and that's exactly what's happening with these general identity extremists they think that doing the performance of bravado and saying, oh, we're, we're willing to debate anyone, yeah, yeah, will actually achieve the same results it does for gender critical feminists. But the thing is, it doesn't, does it? Because gender critical feminists are doing this because it's true. Gender critical feminists are doing it because we are willing to debate and we know the other side is not willing to debate us and we want to show that they're not willing to debate us. So that's why we challenge them to debate. Obviously, ideally, it would be great if they did debate us. Like actually, the thing is, and this is the other key thing, them debating us would be better because then we could destroy their arguments. Um, now, to be fair, sometimes I do challenge people to debates, not really wanting a debate, knowing that they're not going to accept it, because I can't really be bothered. But it's like, I know, like that's the thing, it's got to a point now where I literally do challenge people to debates I don't even want, because I know they're not going to accept it. But there are people who I would genuinely, like for example, I want crit facts. I'm not challenging crit facts to a debate because I know crit facts won't accept it. I'm challenging crit facts to a debate because I would destroy crit facts. Um, so there we go. Sometimes I actually want it, sometimes I don't. But the point is that either way, I'm coming from the position of like, oh, I know that I can handle myself. I know that the other people can't. So let's, let's do it. 
And it seems like I think the gender identity extremists, they see all of that happening. Like, oh, I want to do that too. I'm going to challenge Helen Joyce to a debate. Yeah. And then they're like, look, look, Helen Joyce didn't accept my debate. Look, I, I'm doing it. I'm doing the, 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 the thing. I'm doing the, the challenging somebody to debate and they don't accept me because they're, they're a coward. Ha ha. Look, uh, hashtag no debate from, from the gender critical side. Ha ha. And then, oh, wait, actually it turns out that in order to actually achieve anything, the side you're arguing against needs to genuinely not want to debate you. But the only critical people do want to debate because it will help to show that your ideas are complete nonsense. And ultimately, I think if your ideas are bad, then performance can't save you. The performance of your ideas being um, unassailable by pretending nobody wants to debate you only works if nobody wants to debate you, which in turn only works if your ideas actually are unassailable. We can do it because our ideas can't really be challenged. Gender uh, identity extremists can't because their ideas can. So what's the conclusion here? Well, first of all, you might arrive at the conclusion that there is perhaps an association between uh, believing you are a woman trapped in a man's body and having some, well, you know, not quite firing on all cylinders, let's say. Uh, that's something you might conclude. You might say, isn't it a coincidence that a lot of these people who believe they are women trapped in men's bodies also seem to have lots of other strange things going on in the way they behave and the way they treat other people? Isn't that interesting? But the other conclusion is, of course, I do think these people are just going to look worse and worse and have more and more embarrassments like this until the tide turns. You know, they're not going to suddenly stop embarrassing themselves all the time. Uh, no, it's going to keep happening and we just have to endure it. And eventually things will change. Uh, things are changing. And, you know, ultimately they'll realize that all these attempts to perform being the right you know the right side who's who's willing to show how everyone else is, is silly doesn't work if they can't actually show it you know if you can't actually put ideas where your performance is so yeah that's the end of the video um just kind of it was mostly an opportunity for a rant it's not as if i really like like i say i said going into it, it's not going to be refuting some big intellectual or academic position but uh, either way i still hope you enjoyed it i enjoyed kind of the rant please do like share and subscribe comment below to let me know what you think uh, and if you do want to give on Patreon again, I do do really appreciate it. And I'll just say thank you to my current patrons. In addition to the names scrolling past on your screen right now, I would like to give a special thanks to last month's patrons, Miss and Hassan. Uh, thank you to both of you. You are both very appreciated.